So John is dealing with some significant issue, and you have to ask this, why does John write his gospel? It's very interesting when you look at the synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it, Luke, it seems like they are they're writing the same story and using the same material. You, if you try to read them back to back, you're going to go, wait, I just read this, I just read this, I, I just read this again. And it's great, we need the three different stories, but when you get to John, something significant changes. There's a lot of differences between this. And when you look at the 12 disciples, only four of the disciples actually wrote down something that had made it into the Bible. You can ask about a fifth one, it's debatable. But between you know Matthew, we write the, the gospel. Luke writes a very short letter to the, the children of Israel who are in the diaspora, who have been spread across uh, the Roman world. James and his letters. And then you get to John. So it's interesting that not all of the disciples are even writing this down, but John, for some reason, realizes that something needs to be done and writes this unique book. It seems like John is written in three different stages. When you begin to read this book, you see this beautiful introduction, this prologue of John chapter 1, this word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, and it's gorgeous. It's well put together. Everything is lined up. Here's what it is. But then you get these writings. It starts in Cana, and it's almost like a journal. You're reading John, and you're right with this passionate disciple, and it's, it's now this happened after this, and now this happened to this. It's like his journal, and you're reading this very intimate reading of it. And then you get to the last part in chapter 21. It seems like it was added on. When you get to the end of chapter 20, it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. End of chapter 20. Does that sound like an ending? Now you're going to think that because I just told you that. You start chapter 1, well after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And they were together, Simon Peter. Something happens here at the end of chapter 20 and chapter 21. In chapter 21, I think we begin to see the reason why John is writing this letter. There is a catalyst that happens that causes John to do something. When you get to chapter 21, you'll see this story of the disciples after the resurrection or before Christ shows him, they're out on the Sea of Galilee fishing again. And there's Peter, Nathaniel, James, and John, and two other disciples are out in the Sea of Galilee, and they're fishing. They're not catching anything. Christ is walking on the shore and calls out, do you have any meat? It takes them a while to figure out what's going on. And then it, Christ calls them and says, put your net on the other side. And they throw the net on the other side, and they, they catch 153 fish. Peter realizes it's, it's the Messiah and now rushes into the, to the shores. Christ serves breakfast, and then turns his attention to John, or turns his attention to Peter. And in this dialogue, we see him ask Peter, Peter, do you love me? He asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, of course I love you. And Christ looks at him again and says, but Peter, do, do you really love me? And Peter's like, yes, I love you. And then Christ asks the third time, Peter, do you really, really love me? Peter's like, of course I love you. And it says that he became ashamed or distraught at the third asking. Why did Christ ask Peter three times? What's the story? The story tells us Peter was, was at the, the, the trial of Christ, and they, they're like, wait a minute, you're, you're one of his disciples, right? You, me? No, I can't be right. But, but you even speak Galilean. No. This is the third time he even curses. I swear to God, I am not. And, and Christ looks at Peter and says, Okay, Peter, it's more than words. You say it. But are you going to follow me? There's a very precise phrase right after this. Because... They were asking about when certain people were going to die. 
and if they were going to die before Christ returns. And it says that Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? That phrase, the disciples, or at least the followers of Jesus at that time, took it to say the disciples would not die before Christ returned. Their end times theology was wrong. So they tied this on to say, okay, the disciples are going to all, at least they're not all going to die before Christ returns. So in this dispersion of Jews and in this dispersion of Christians, it goes from Antioch of Syria now into Ephesus being the home church. Paul has just went all over the Roman Empire at this point. The disciples have scattered all over the known world from India into Africa, all the way up into England. This movement has taken off in 15, 20 years. It has exploded. But something happens. I want you to step back into the world of the 60s and 70s AD. It's a new church. Only 30 years after Christ leaves, it's an explosive movement led by dynamic leaders, people who walked with Christ, first generation leaders. They have lived with Christ, saw him resurrected. But the church is tired. The world is falling apart. The disciples are dying. In just a few years, James put to death by a sword by Herod Agrippa. Philip tortured and crucified. Matthew was beheaded. James, the head of the church in Jerusalem, James pushed off the temple and then killed. And then July 18, 64 AD, something happens in Rome. It catches fire. 70% of Rome burns. You read through the story, stories and it's just Terrible, the fire came from all directions and burned thousands. Nero trying to, to take the blame off himself turns the blame to the Christians. And I'm going to read out a Tacitus here. And so to get rid of this humor, rumor, Nero set up and falsely accused as the culprits and punished with the utmost refinement of cruelty, a class hated for their abominations who were commonly called Christians. Christ, from whom their name is derived, was executed at the hands of the procurator Pontius Pilate. The movement checked for a moment, but the superstition again broke out, not only in Judea now, but even in the heart of Rome. First arrest was made of those who confessed. Then on their evidence, an immense multitude was convicted. Besides being put to death, they were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clothed in the hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. Others were crucified. Others set on fire to illuminate the night when daylight failed. Of those who were burned, some were tied or nailed to stakes, held still by a hook driven through the throat so they could not move the head when the pitch waxed and other flammable substance were poured boiling over their heads and set on fire. Nero had thrown open the grounds for his display and was putting on a show in the circus where he mingled with the people and drove about in his chariot. Because of this, Paul's head is beheaded and immediately falling, Peter is crucified upside down in Rome. Andrew's crucified on an olive tree. Thomas has now been thrust through with a spear and tormented with hot plates and burned alive. Bartholomew is crucified. Matthias was stoned and crucified. John's the last guy standing. They're gone. Peter's dead, Paul's dead. What do you do? How do you convince people that it's still worth it? Is it worth torment? Is it worth even to the point of being lit on fire and burned to death? Children, family, co-workers. You want to talk about fear. You know the people that are being questioned right now. And if they give your name, you're next. The faith of the church is rattled. 
And they had believed that the disciples would not die before Christ returned. Now what? They are trying, scrambling to understand this gospel. The patristic fathers, the early church fathers, write that John was in Jerusalem at this time. It says that he hurries to Ephesus, the heart of the church, the home church of this movement. He's trying to create some organization again back in the movement, saying, okay, let's, let's huddle back together. It's not over. Here's how we move forward. So Paul preached it. Peter witnessed to his testimony. John is now sitting down. I need to rewrite. I need to write this gospel message in its entirety. It's a new exodus. It's a new genesis. There's something new that's here that these people need to hear it. And John is calling these people back to the gospel. Hebrews 11 puts together a really great understanding of this. It says, remember those earlier days that you had received the light when you endured in great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison, joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly awarded. So when you read through John, you're going to feel an urgency. These powerful stories are in, written in a way with such tremendous weight behind them. Imagine him sitting there trying to write through this and think through, how can I portray that this is worth it for these people? He's grabbing them, trying to get their attention, show them the urgency in this message. There is a story. There is an eyewitness account. Here is the gospel of Jesus Christ sitting there as an early believer, hearing John read these, these stories or reading his writings for the first time, what would you say to that? I can't, I can't grasp what some of these early Christians did. Some of them would stand there and see somebody on the burning pile and they would look around and say, anybody, or anybody else is Christians and they would climb up on the pile beside them. But when you grasp this concept that he is the resurrection of the life, death it's but a moment. When you read these stories of John, you realize the weight of it and saying, people, God can do everything. Yes, the disciples will die, but Christ lives in us. We could spend hours, days, a lifetime trying to understand the theology of John. But ultimately, it's as simple as John 3.16. Pulling us back. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. Pulling us back to this very simple truth. Do you believe this eyewitness story or not? John's saying, I was there. I saw it. I lived with him. I saw him dead. I saw him raised. Yes, everybody has died around us. He weaves through this. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Samaritan. It doesn't matter if you're an outcast. It doesn't matter if you're blind or lame. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. All are now welcomed with Christ. And then he says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And when I come back, I'm going to receive you to myself. We are now the betrothed bride of Christ. We're under covenant with him. Our faith is in him to do what he needs to do. The story we don't know. I hope we don't have to go through persecution like they did. But we may. But when we read this, we realize that he is the good shepherd. He is the true vine. He is the word. He is the life. And everything is in him. And then you realize this story hits home. We're called to go no matter the consequence. It doesn't tell us that our glory is in our death. Our glory is bringing life and light to men. So Christ looks at Peter and says, don't look around. Don't worry about who's going to die or not. Will you follow me?
I ask that question, will you follow him? Do you believe the testimony that these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ? I ask of you, if you have time, read John. Spend time in it. Sit down and say, okay, step back into 60, 70 AD. How these stories would have impacted you. And then just open up the news. Get scared again. And go, wait a minute. I need to read John and reread it again. Thank you.